We're starting a new series this evening, Back to Basics. It's called Back to Basics. I want to talk to you just about a couple of success principles. When we get back to basics, it gives us those success principles. So often in our work situation or even in our marriages, if we just go back to basics, things work a whole lot better. And so I want to share some success principles with you this evening. Now, whenever we think of of life principles, success principles, we expect to find them in the book of Proverbs. Isn't that so? Because King Solomon gave us so many great uh, uh, principles. But this time, we're not going to go to the book of Proverbs. We're going to actually skip back a couple of books. We're going to go very much to the beginning of the Bible, the second book in the Bible, book of Exodus. And we're going to look at Exodus chapter 20. What do we find there? The Ten Commandments. God's top ten. Do you know God was the first one to have a top ten, by the way? We're going to look at God's top ten. And those are basically those that brings us back to the basics. God gives us the basics in in, in the top ten. And so, you know, uh, even though God has given us those ten commandments thousands of years before, they're still as applicable today is what they were way back, way back then. And, and just by the way, these Ten Commandments aren't suggestions. Uh, they, they are not recommendations. They are still commandments. God says, that's how I want you to live. No other way. Those are, those are commandments. And you'll find when you apply these in your life, you'll find these are simply keys to a blessed and a and a prosperous and a successful life. There's no doubt about it. Civilizations that have embraced these commandments and and followed these commandments have flourished. And those who haven't have paid the price. All right. Now, many people see the Ten Commandments as a list of rules, a list of do's and don'ts, and thou shalt, and thou shalt not, and and that sort of thing. And, And on the one hand, it's true. There is that side to it. God gives us a standard. God says, this is how I want you to live. This is my standard. This is who I am. And I want you to live that way. It's almost like the one leg that it stands on. It's got standard. And then there's another leg, and it's those success principles. God says, this is my standard. He says, but if you apply it, he says, you'll find it's going to work in your life. You, you, it's amazing. He says, he says, I'm giving you some keys to success over here. It's almost like a father who says to his son, he says, I don't want you to go and play in the street. I want you to play in the yard. And it's not because he wants to spoil his fun. It's not because he, he just wants to be mean or something like that. But because he, has, he, has the best, he wants the best for his son. Isn't that so? And so in a way, in a way, the father is giving his son an instruction or a commandment. He's saying, thou shalt not play in the street. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Now listen, if the father had used that language, little guy's eyes would be big. What, what do you mean? What are you saying? All right, but that's what he's saying. And it's not to spoil his fun. It's to help him. It's to bless him. It's to make sure that he does well one day. And God does exactly the same. And so the Ten Commandments really, it's just a moral code for our own good. You've got to see it like that. It's not just a list of do's and don'ts. It's this moral code for our own good. Something that's going to help us going forward. You see, whenever we follow God's instructions, blessings follow. I want you to see that this evening. Whenever we follow God's instructions, blessings follow. Listen to what God says to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1. He says, be careful to to obey all the law my, uh, my servant Moses gave you. What law was he referring to? He was referring to the Ten Commandments. God had given Moses the Ten Commandments, and Moses had passed that down. And so God is saying, he's saying, hey, that law that Moses gave you, he says, be careful to obey all the law. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. And so God is simply saying here, you follow my word blessings will follow you. You follow the law, the instructions in my word. He says, success 
will follow you. I want to give you another scripture quickly, three scriptures uh, from Psalm chapter 1. It's one of my favorite psalms. Listen to this. It says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And, th and then this is what happens. It says, he is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. In other words, this tree doesn't go through seasons. Well, it's a good season. You know, I can really see the Lord's blessing. And then down the line, man, I'm going through a really tough time. This is a really tough season. I have no leaves at the moment. And so what, what Scripture is saying Scripture is saying here, whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prospers. It's almost like looking at somebody and saying, man, whatever that God touches turns to gold. And I'm not just referring to monetary blessing. There's blessing in this person's life. Where does that come from? According to Scripture, it says, you follow my word. He says, blessings will follow you. It's one of the keys to living a blessed and a prosperous life. Now, some people, they think, well, you know, this is a bit old, Leonard. It's a bit outdated, especially the Old Testament part. I don't know if that really applies to us today, let alone the Ten Commandments. Are you serious? The Ten Commandments? Absolutely. I want to show you this evening, and I want to spend just a couple of moments, and, and I'm Unfortunately, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dump a whole lot of Scripture on you, probably about eight, nine, ten Scriptures. We're just going to run through the one after the other. But what I want to show you is that it's very much, the, the, the Ten Commandments is very much for today as well. I want you to get that clear in your mind. You see, we're starting a series, and I want to set that foundation as it were. And so stay with me. Don't, don't get lost as we run through these Scriptures. But I just want to quickly give you that foundation, set it as a foundation, and then what we're going to do later on, I'm going to quickly look at the first commandment that God gives us. We'll just look at one tonight, and then we'll, we'll run through the others, Lord willing, as, as, uh, as the weeks go by. Now, you ask yourself, is, is the Ten Commandments still for today? Because you see, some people look at it and they say, but Leonard, you know, that's law, and we're not under the law, we're under grace it's true, it's true, but it's only partly true. Let me show you why I say that. And I'll quickly, I'll quickly show you. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I've come to fulfill them. You see, folks, in the Old Testament, the law was written on tablets of stone. In the New Testament, the Bible says, it's written on our hearts. I'm going to give you two scriptures quickly for that. In Hebrews 8 verse 10, it says, This is the, co the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. He says, he says I'm not doing away with the law. Not at all. He says, as a matter of fact, I'm going to put it on your heart. Here's another scripture. It says the same thing. Romans 2.15. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts. It's, it's referring to the Gentiles. It's written in their hearts. For their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. And so in Matthew chapter 22, an expert of the law comes to Jesus. He knows the law backwards. And so he comes to Jesus and he says to him, he says, Rabbi, he says, which is the greatest of all of, all of these? And by the way, they didn't only have the Ten Commandments. They had a, a whole list of, of others as well. And so he comes to Jesus and he says to him, now, which one is the greatest? And what's interesting is Jesus doesn't come and single one out and take one or, or take this one and say, well, I think it's this one or it's definitely that one. He doesn't do that. What he does, he sums them up. And he says, he makes the statement and he says, 
Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and your soul and your, your mind. He says this is the first and the greatest commandment. But he says the, the second one is equally as important. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then he makes this statement in verse 40. And he says the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Do you see how Jesus is not doing away with the law? He's, he's not saying that's not important. He's saying, as a matter of fact, he says it's very important. He says, he says, but let me summarize it for you. And so he takes it together and he says, he says if, if, if you fulfill these three things, loving God, loving people as you love self, he says, man, then you fulfilled the law. And so my point very simply this evening, my point is this, you can't look at the Ten Commandments and think it's old, or it's outdated, or it's irrelevant. According to Jesus, it's very much relevant for today. But now, let me clarify something for us, and this is very important. Keeping the Ten Commandments is not a way of obtaining salvation. All right? Let's be clear on that. But rather, it highlights our need for salvation. So we, we can't obtain salvation. It is not a ticket to heaven. Well, I've, I've done this and I've done that and I haven't. Then, then we're doing it through works. And we can't do it through works. You see, if you and I had to rate ourselves on the Ten Commandments, we had to go through that very soon. You realize, man, I'm in trouble. You know, I think, I think I'm, a, I'm maybe a one or a two out of ten I can definitely tick the box that says, thou shalt not murder. I haven't done that recently, you know. But you soon realize, man, I can't tick all these boxes. I'm a sinner. I'm in trouble. I need a Savior. And that's what the Apostle Paul says. Listen to what he says here. He says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in, in his sight, by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. And so what he's saying is, man, the more we try and keep the law, the more we realize we're sinners. Man, I'm, I'm, I, there's no ways I can keep all of this. Man, I, I need a savior. And so Paul just makes it very clear in this chapter that we're not justified by keeping the law. We, we're justified by grace and by putting our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says it's not the law, it's grace. It's a free gift, it's, it's given to you. Now how do you, how do you take a gift that, that's, that you can't see, it's not tangible? How do you take a gift like that? By faith, it's the only way to do it. You take the gift of salvation, the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, you take it by faith. I welcome you into my life. I welcome you as my Lord and Savior. And from today on, I know I'm going to heaven. Where did that come from? Faith. It's the only way to do it. No other way. You can't do something for it. You can't earn it. You've got to do it by faith. Now the Apostle Paul says this. He says, all right, all right. If this is a grace gift, he says, and, and, and if, if we do it by faith, what about the law then? Do we, do we nullify the law? Do we ignore the law? Is the law not important? And he says, no. Listen to what he says. He says, do we then nullify the law by this faith? No, not at all. He says, rather, we uphold the law. New Testament. So he's saying, hey, you and I better uphold the law. Now, here's the last one quickly, and then we're going to move on. In Romans chapter 7, we've been looking at chapter 3. In Romans chapter 7, Paul makes a very strong case that even though the law has, has no power to save us, he says, he says, you can't be saved through the law by keeping the law and keeping the commandments. There's no power in that. He says, but you've got to realize the problem is not the law. He says, don't, don't look at the law now as the problem. He says, the problem is sin in our lives. And so he just highlights that for us. Listen to what he says. He says, well then, 
am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? He says, of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said, you must not covet. And so he's basically saying, he's saying, if it wasn't for the law, I wouldn't even know I'm busy messing up and, and, and I'm a sinner. He says the law has just highlighted that. Now listen to this, verse 12. This is important. He says, the law itself is holy and its commands are holy and right and good. It's holy and right and good. And so I hope that settles it in your mind. That, that the Ten Commandments aren't old and obsolete and irrelevant. The Bible says, hey, hey, they're very much relevant for today. They are holy and they are right for today and they are good. You better follow them. The Apostle Paul says we better uphold the law. All right. So let's quickly get into the first commandment. I want to quickly just unpack that this evening. The first commandment is, is found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. And this is what God says. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. That's how he starts off. And in verse 5, he says, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. He says, I'm a jealous God. Now, that shouldn't really surprise us because I think as, as, as humans, we're very familiar with that emotion. We're familiar with, with jealousy. And, and I'm talking about a healthy jealousy, a jealousy that a husband has for a wife, a wife has for a, for a, for a husband, or, a, or, a, or a, a guy has for his girlfriend. There's a healthy jealousy. I don't just share my wife with anybody. Uh, I've never met a guy who really loves his wife or really loves his girlfriend that says, man, I don't mind sharing her from time to time. I don't mind if she sleeps with somebody else from time to time. It's like, no ways. That's not going to happen. Why? Because I'm jealous over her. And in the same way, God is jealous over us. You know why? Because the Bible calls us the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. So he looks upon us as a, as a, as a, as a, as a husband would look upon his, his bride and there's a jealousy and he's saying, man, I don't, I don't want to share you. Do you know one of, the, one of the names of God is Jealous, capital J. Like Jehovah, we have Jealous. I see some of you looking at me with big eyes. You're thinking... Leonard, where did you get that one? Does that come from the book of Leonard chapter 1 verse 3? No, 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 no. Exodus chapter 34. Let me show you quickly. Exodus says, Do not worship any other God for the Lord whose name is Jealous, capital J, is a jealous God. Do you now understand why the first commandment says, you shall have no other gods? Because he says, I'm not just a little bit jealous over you. He says, man, my name is jealous. He says, I don't, I don't, I, I, I'm not going to share you with no other gods, no other distractions. I want you to serve me with all of your heart, all of your soul. Isaiah 45 confirms this. He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. And so can I, can I summarize that first commandment for us? Basically what God is saying here, he's, he's saying to you and me, I want you to put me first. I want you to give me priority in your life. That's what he's saying. Put me first. Give me priority. You say, all right, what does that mean? What does that look like in our everyday lives? Because I, I, you know I want to try and make this practical. Sunday after Sunday, that's what I try and do. What does that look like? Let it show us in our everyday lives. All right, if God is a priority in our lives, it'll show in our lives. Well, how? One of the first areas where it'll show is in our church attendance. 
It simply means if God is a priority, then this is a priority. And so for most of you, it is. This is what you do. You hear every single Sunday night. And you know how I know that? Because you sit in the same seat every single Sunday night. And so if this seat is open on a Sunday night, I don't go and look for Anton somewhere else. I don't think, now where is he sitting? Because he's not here. He's sick at home or he's out of town or something. Why? Because that's his seat on a Sunday night. What he doesn't know, there's old auntie that has it on a Sunday morning. All right? <laughs> but that's where he sits. And, and I want to honor you because for most of you, for most of you, you hear every single Sunday night. Why? Because it's become a priority. It's what we do. Now, for some people, it's almost like they flick a coin. Heads or tails. Church or movies or whatever they do, you know? It's like, shall we go, shall we do something else? You see, it's not a priority. It's a convenience. And so if it's, if it's convenient, they'll come to church. If it suits them, if they feel like it. But for, for most of us, we've moved beyond that. And it's become a priority in our lives. Why? Because God is a priority. And so, man, I thank God that I grew up like this, that, that my parents didn't give us, a, they, they didn't give us any other option. You know, this was installed in us from, from, from a very young age. You say, oh, Leonard, big deal. You know, your parents were the pastors. You had no choice. Well, absolutely, I didn't. But I thank God for that. But now let me tell you, when we became teenagers, I, we, we, we thought we had a choice. We tried, we tried to push the boundary about, I would say, one and a half times. We tried. And, and by the second time, we realized, don't even waste your time. Don't even go there. And so for my folks, it, was, it wasn't even negotiable. Was, don't, even, don't even ask. Don't even ask. You've you got to be like really dead before we don't come. And so you, you, you look like you're right. Let's go. And so that's what we do. But let me tell you, let me tell you, today I'm grateful for that. I really am, because it's instilled a value in my life that being amongst God's people in God's presence around God's word is one of the most important things. That's why the Bible says, don't neglect this. Don't neglect the gathering of the saints. If God's priority, this is, this is priority. And you'll find this principle of priority, the principle of, of putting God first, You'll find it right throughout the Bible. You can go all the way back, the book of Genesis, all the way through, you'll find this principle. When, when the children of Israel, were they about to enter into the promised land, God said to them, He said, you see that city over there, Jericho? He says, that place is filled with silver and gold. He says, and you can go and take all that silver and gold, but you bring it to me. It belongs to me, all of it. Why? Because it was the first city that they would take. There would be many cities after that. God wants first. He said to them, he says, when you harvest your crops, I want the first fruits. When your sheep has little lambs, he says, I want the firstborn. Now imagine going to God and say, hang on, hang on, hang on. Can't we wait a little bit? Because this, this little lamb is so cute, man. And the second one, man, this is my only black one. I've got a white one and a black one. I've got this little pair now. And so, so can't we just wait a little bit? And, and, and by the time I have the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth, by the time I get tired of these little lambs, I'll give you that last little one over there. God says, really? Are you serious? I don't stand last in the queue. I'll have first. But God, what if, what, if, what if I only have two little lambs? And God said, well, then you're going to have to trust me for more, isn't that? You see, friends, this is what it's about. It's about trust. It's about trust. 
The Bible says the just shall live by trust. As a matter of fact, four times, Scripture tells us four times, the just shall live by faith, by trust. Without faith, the Bible says, it's impossible to please God. And so the principle, you see, if we understand the principle, the principle is this. Give to God first and trust Him for the rest. And he says, that's how I've designed it to work. He says, and that's how we're going to operate. Give to God first and trust him for the rest. So the question we've got to ask ourselves is, do we do that with our finances? Well, Leonard, you see, that's the problem. Because I've got plenty of bills to pay. I've got to pay SARS. I've got to pay DSTV. You know, DSTV, very important, you know. Got to pay DSTV. Got to pay my house. Got to pay my car. Got to pay the school fees. I've got to pay this, and I've got to pay that, and I've got to pay the next thing. And then when you're done there, well, then, then we'd like to. I don't have to, but we like to eat out a little bit as well. Okay, and then, well, then maybe if I have something left over, Maybe I can give to God. That's interesting. So God's not a priority in our lives. DSTV is a priority. And our house and the BMW and all of those things. That's all a priority until, until we lose our job. We don't get the contract in the business. And business suddenly takes a turn. And then what happens? Then God becomes a priority. Then we start looking toward God. You see, friends, there are essentially five things that we can do with our money. I'll put it on the screen for you quickly. Have a look at this. We can spend it, and most of us are pretty good with that. (laughs) And then we can repay debt. That's if we were really good with the first one, all right? And then we can pay taxes. And most people, you you know, you'll find those first three, that's where the bulk of their money goes. And if they have something left after that, then they'll save it or invest it. And if there's something left after that, well, then maybe we'll give some to God, to the church. And so that's generally what the priority looks like. Priority number one, spending. Priority number two, repaying debt. Priority number three, we pay taxes. Then if there's something, we save. And then, then only, we give. Can you see how God's right at the bottom of our list? Where God's not a priority on our list. Now, I know there are people who think, oh man, but but you know this tithing thing. It's Old Testament. I think we've settled the Old Testament thing. But, 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 but you know, it's, uh, you know, you know I, I don't know. Listen, listen, let, let me just say to you. Do you know that this whole tithing thing, the whole giving thing, was established long before even the Ten Commandments? Just by the way, long before that. As a matter of fact, 2,500 years before the Ten Commandments was given. It was already established, this whole principle of first. You can go all the way back, all the way back to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. And the one farmed with crops and the one farmed with animals. And both boys brought offerings to God. And God was happy with the one's offering. And and God, God looked favorably upon it, the Bible says, and not upon the other one. Why? What was the difference? Let me show you from Scripture quickly. Genesis chapter 4, it says, Abel kept flocks, animals, and Cain worked the soil, crops. And in the course of time, now those words are extremely important. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. I want you to notice something. It doesn't say anything about first fruits. In the course of time. So somewhere along the way, he was harvesting, and weeks later, he was still harvesting and still harvesting, and then he realized, man, actually, I've got plenty here. Maybe I should give a little bit to God. And God looked upon that, and God's not happy with that. But Abel, look, listen to what he did. Abel brought fat portions from some of the 
firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. And so this is a principle that you can see right through Scripture. Old Testament, New Testament, you can, you can have a look at it. I'm going to show you in a moment from the New Testament, from, from Matthew, what, what Jesus says. But let me just quickly give you Proverbs chapter 3. He says, honor the Lord. That word honor is so important. It says, honor the Lord. How? With your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. And so what he's saying is, when you give to God, you're honoring Him. You're honoring Him. And we all know that Scripture teaches us if we honor God, God will honor us. Isn't that so? It's just in His heart. Now let me show you quickly what Jesus says about this. In Matthew chapter 6, he says, Why be like the pagans who are so deeply concerned about these things. What is he referring to when he says these things? They're concerned about these things. They're concerned about earthly things, about, about uh, their income, about their retirement, about their, their houses and stuff like that. And so he says, why be like them? They're so deeply concerned about these things. He says, your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Now listen to this. This is an amazing promise. He says, and he will give you all you need, not some of what you need, not partially. He says, all of what you need from day to day, if, here's the condition, there's a promise with a condition. He will give you all you need if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary, your first concern. And so what Jesus is saying, he's saying, hey, God knows what you need. And he will supply not some of it. He will supply everything you need, provided he has the condition. You put him first. You give him priority in your life. And so even Jesus is saying to us, he's saying, hey, you want, to, you want your finances to work. You want your business to work. Go back to basics. Where do I find that? Exodus chapter 20. Way back. Go back to basics. Put God first and you'll find it works. Listen, friends. This is not a money issue. This is a trust issue. Do you trust God enough to put Him first in your life? First in your finances. Why does God ask us for our, our finances? Well, firstly, His church has got to operate. All right? Somebody's got to pay for the lights and the water. And, 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 and you know, otherwise, Mark's not going to have apples to eat. All right? And so, so that's, that's the one reason. All right? But the other reason why God, I believe God asks for money. Because it plays such a huge part in our lives. And it can become an idol. It really can. And so one of the ways to break the power of greed in our lives is through giving. And so God says, man, I, I want to establish this thing in your life. That the first thing you do, your first lambs, first income, the first transfer that you do, first transfer. You don't wait till the end of the month, right in the beginning. I want you to do that transfer. I want to break that power of greed in, in your life. You're going to put me first, he says, then, then do it through your, through your finances. Listen, friends, it's a trust issue. Remember the story of the, the widow of Zarephath. This happened during, during a time where they, they were going through, they were facing a, a severe famine. And so it, it, was, it was very, very rough. And so God says to the prophet Elijah, he had nothing to eat and, and he, was, he was completely broke. God says to him, go to this widow, and she's going to provide for you. You know what's amazing? God's plan was to provide for Elijah through the widow, but to provide for the widow through Elijah. God was going to bless both of them. God brings them together, let their paths cross. And so God sends him to Zarephath. As he, as he approaches this town, as he gets to the gate, there's this widow outside busy collecting firewood. And so he sees this widow. This is the widow. And so he asks her for some water. 
And so she doesn't recognize him, must be a stranger. And so she says, okay, fine, no problem. She goes into the, into the little town to the, the fountain or the well or whatever. And so she goes, goes and gets him some water. And as he goes, he says, he says by the way, if you, if you don't mind, please bring me a toasted cheese as well. He says, man, I'm, I'm really hungry. What he didn't realize is, man, she didn't even have bread, let alone cheese. No bread, not even moldy bread. What he didn't know, she was collecting firewood because she was going to make a fire and bake a little bread, probably a little, little fat, flat bread, pita bread or like a naan bread. That's what they did in those days. And she was going to bake this little bread for her and her son. They were going to share it. That's all they had. And they would possibly die after that. They, they were, she was down to her last little handful of flour, last little bit of ingredients. And so she shares this with him. She says to him, she says, I don't have bread. She says, as a matter of fact, and she tells him the whole story. And if it was me, I would have said to her, man, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry to hear that. I, I didn't know that. And I would have turned straight to God and said, God, you sent me to the wrong widow. She's poor. She got nothing. Where's the other one? Where's the rich one? But he doesn't do that. You know what he says to her? And this is a bit of a cheek. But he says to her, he says, don't fear. Go and do as I've said. <laughs> what didn't you understand about what I've just told you? He says, go and do what I've said. He says, but make me a small cake from it here. And what's the word? First. There's that word again. He says, make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterwards, make some for yourself and your son. And she's probably thinking, is this guy crazy? How can, how can I do that? Uh, you know, how can he even expect that of me? You know, what if this thing doesn't work out? What if, you know, and, and so she's obviously, she's got all these emotions going through her mind. She's, she's just human, just like you and me. We would have exactly the same emotion. What if? And he gives her a promise. Before she can even say that to him, she's busy, this is busy going through her mind. And, and, and he stops her and he gives her a promise. Listen to the promise. He says to her, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. What a promise. He gives her this incredible promise. And so she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. In other words, she took that promise. She says, I'll act upon that. And she and her household ate for many days. God fulfilled his promise as he always does. So what was his instruction to her? Put me first. Trust God for the rest. What is God's instruction to you and me this evening? Exactly the same thing. Put me first and trust me for the rest. But Leonard, what if? You know, how can he even expect that of me? What if it doesn't work out? What if we have all these questions exactly the same as what she had? Come on. We're sitting here with those same questions. What if? And just like Elijah had a, had a promise from God for her. I have a promise from God for you this evening. Listen to this promise. It's amazing. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And then he says, test me in this. He says, go ahead. Go ahead, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Wow, what a promise. But you know what he's promising over here? Provision. And when God provides, he doesn't give you just enough. But he blesses you where you think, God, man, I, I don't deserve this. And you look at your business and you think, but God, how come we're doing so well? I, I don't deserve this. Why? 
Because that's who our God is. When God blesses, He blesses big time. He doesn't just do it mediocre. He does a decent job of it. And so God, God promises us provision. But here's the second part of the promise. We're not finished. He says, he says, I'll bless you and you will not have room enough for it. And then he says in verse 11, and I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. What does that sound like? Protection. In other words, what he's saying is he's saying, I will prevent pests from taking your flat screen. <laughs> All right? Those pests. He says, my angels, you have no idea. They will chase that pest right out of Gauteng. All right? Come on, we, we're laughing and, and it's good. But God promises us protection and provision. Protection and provision. And so there's the widow. And so she's got to decide, do I take God at his word? Do I trust him? And you and I have got exactly that same decision tonight. Do I, do I dare to take God at his word and to trust him? Because this is crazy, man. This doesn't make sense. And, and she felt exactly the same. She says, go and make this, bake this bread and your flour won't run out. And in her mind, this is crazy. She can't figure it out just like you and I. Cannot figure out the supernatural. You'll never figure God out. But that's how it works. Let me end with a last story quickly. One of my friends is a, is a small group leader, cell leader here in church. And so one of the guys in his small group, they were chatting the one evening. And this guy admitted that, that he's never tithed. And so this friend of mine was kind of taken aback. Because it's, it's, it's just, it's something that he does. It's, it's a part of his life, like myself. That's what we do. It's, I grew up with that. I thank God for that. And so this friend of mine as well, and God has really blessed him. And so he listens to this other guy, and he's kind of shocked. And he says to him, why not? He says, well, I've, I've, I've never done this. It's kind of new for me or to me, and, 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 and I can't really afford it. He said, are you crazy? You can't afford not to. He says, he says, man, you're robbing yourself and you're robbing your family as a father of the house. He says, you're not leading well. You'd be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> Fortunately, they were friends. Could speak straight to him. I appreciate guys like that. And then he said this to him. He says, all right, I'll make you a deal. He says, he says, you start tithing. He says, make up your mind. But if this is what you want to do, if you want to honor God, he says, you start tithing. And if you can't make it at the end of the month, not because you've been stupid and, and having a, a, a takeaways every second night. He says, if you look after your finance the way you're doing now, and you tithe, and you can't make it at the end of the month, he says, I'll give it back to you. That was a couple of years ago. He's never had to give it back. As a matter of fact, this other guy, his finances are on a completely different level. God has taken his business. He's blessed him. It's just when, when I look at it, I, I look back, it's like, wow. Why? Because he's honored God. Friends, it's a trust issue. It's all it is. I thank God as a youngster. My, 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 uh, they still had checks back those days. Some of you have no idea what I'm even talking about. All right? <laughs> I can remember at the end of the month on my dad's desk in his study, there would be a check. The first check he wrote out would be to Maranatha Church. He would write it out with his tithe. And he would put it on the corner of his desk. Next time he goes to church, next Sunday, that's what he's taking. First check. For you and me, first transfer that we do. I thank God for that. I've seen God's provision, God's blessing upon my life, upon our family, and even upon the church because we do that. And as a church, you know. We help people. We bless other churches. Wherever we can, we do that. Why? 
because God's blessing us. Amen. Come on, let's stand. We want to thank God just for His Word this evening. Lord, just thank You so much. We just want to come to You tonight and, and thank You, Lord, for just, just bringing us back to basics. And our prayer this evening, help us, Lord, like the widow, to put our trust in You. It's just a trust issue. Help us, Lord, to put our trust in You. And in the weeks ahead, Father God, the, just, just these principles, the basics that we're just going to revisit again. Lord, help us to get these things in place. Not that it's our ticket to heaven, not at all. Jesus has done that. He's paid in full. Thank you, Jesus. But somehow, Lord, these are principles for success. We want to get these things sorted in our lives. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you.